In this picture that you see right here, this is Julius Irving from the 1986-87 season, uh, the last year he played. And it was known throughout the whole season that would be his last. And <clears throat> uh, fans throughout that season paid tribute to him. Teams and players, uh, opposing teams and players, paid tribute to him. And I believe on YouTube you could find uh, video footage of the last game that he played uh, during the playoffs. And you can see how much people uh, respected this guy. And I think sometimes today he is not given the respect that I think he should be uh, receiving. Um, don't get me wrong, people um, admire him. But sometimes I think people give him the Jackie Robinson uh, treatment. Uh, by that I mean sometimes people look at him for a role that he played. Uh, sometimes I think it's, it's sort of limited to him being the star, the face of the NBA in the time when the NBA was dying. Uh, and then afterward, they just talk about Magic and Larry, and then Michael later on, who just took it to another level. And it's like Julius Irving has forgotten for what he uh, his contributions were. And when I say Jackie Robinson effect, I also mean that some people forget that a guy like Jackie Robinson was good. He was a good player. He's a Hall of Fame player. Um, he's not in the Hall of Fame just because of the fact that he was the first. Uh, he may not have been the most talented player from the Negro Leagues, but he was good. Um, Julius Irving uh, sometimes is looked at as this guy who was just so incredible uh, athletically uh, that he was so uh, before his time. And I've actually seen some fans, some idiots, say that in today's NBA, Julius Irving. Uh, would be just another player. Uh, you know, he, he wouldn't be anything special. Uh, and I, I truly sometimes wonder uh, whether these fans watch games or whether they just listen to the opinions of biased analysts and go from there. You know, some people are so... Some people... Today, it's very easy to stay stuck in a world where you're only listening to people who agree with you. Um, I think it's easy. I think it's, I don't want to go into that. That's, that's a whole nother thing. But anyway, Julius Irving uh, took the torch from Elgin Baylor, who really was the first player to uh, play above the rim and uh, on a given level and Julius Irving just took it to another level he was the one who modernized the NBA in that aspect and uh, some people just look at him as just a dunker and he wasn't just a dunker this guy all right was a scorer uh, I think he won I believe he won three ABA scoring titles uh, he was the Michael Jordan of the of the ABA, um, he uh, also. Some people say, "Well, why wasn't he scoring like that in the NBA?" And you know, <clears throat> you gotta take a look at who were on those teams in the uh, with the Philadelphia 76ers when he came to the NBA in 1976-77. Or these teams were loaded with talent, loaded with offensive players. Uh, okay, Daryl Dawkins wasn't the greatest scorer uh, as far as vo uh, volume of points. He was very accurate. I think I believe he shot 57% for his career. 
uh, which is one of the highest of all time. He was very, uh, he was somewhat disappointing as an NBA player. Uh, but he was inconsistent, but Daryl Dawkins was on those teams. Uh, young Daryl Dawkins, too. Uh, George McGinnis was on the, those teams. Um, Doug Collins was still playing before the injuries uh, ended his career prematurely. Um, a young Lloyd B. Free, who later on will become World B. Free, uh, averaged 30 points per game for the Clippers during the, I think, the 19... 19- 79-80 season, or it might be the 80-81 season, I can't remember. Uh, averaged 30 points per game. Uh, Lloyd B. Free was on the, that team. Some other guys, it's not coming to my mind right now, who were scorers were on that team. So Julius Irving's role pretty much was, look, look Doc, uh, we know all the huge role that you had with your teams, the Virginia Squires and the New York Nets, and with the ABA. What we want you to do is focus on scoring. And he scored. He scored 20, 21, 22 points per game, 23, 24, 25 points for, per game for his career uh, with the uh, Sixers. Whereas in the ABA, he did it all. He was a scorer. He was a tremendous rebounder for his position. I mean tremendous. He could, he was, I think he had one season I'm trying to. I'm going by memory now. I might be off, but I think he had one season in the ABA where he averaged like 14 rebounds a game, or 13 rebounds a game. And this was when pace was slowing down, and he didn't have these super inflated totals that you had back in the 60s. You know, style of play was not quite as frenetic and up and down. Um, but you know. He was an underrated passer. Uh, he was He's a truly underrated defensive player. Um, he was a prime time clutch player. I'm going to also give you, okay, uh, also give you a, an idea about how uh, little respect the ABA gets and how... Um, Modern analysts really don't respect the ABA. I remember a couple of years ago, uh, Deron Williams scored uh, 57 points for the New Jersey Nets. And I kept seeing uh, ESPN refer to this as the all-time franchise record. And I remember like saying to myself, these guys are complete idiots. Uh, well, I don't want to say idiots, but that's not... Correct. Uh, they should be saying that's the NBA franchise record. That's not the franchise record. The franchise record still is 63 by Julius Irving when the Nets were still in the NBA. All right. And I know the NBA um, should at least recognize the ABA numbers. If you merge with the league, then you should recognize the ABA's history. Uh, I know sometimes there's a differentiate between uh, NBA numbers and ABA numbers, but I tend to recognize the ABA. The ABA wasn't as talented as the NBA, but it was talented. And um, if you combine the NBA and the ABA, Julius Irvin's numbers are absolutely incredible. Uh, 30,000 points uh, off the top of my head. I, points per game, I don't, I can't, uh, I think it's 24 points per game for his career. Uh, he was, uh, I, I believe, I'm, I'm sure he had over 10,000 rebounds uh, if you combine. Uh, just absolutely phenomenal numbers. He was a tremendous shot blocker for uh, being a small forward. He had probably one of the largest set of hands that you will ever see in an athlete. I have large hands uh, myself, and mine aren't quite as big as his. Uh, I mean, this guy was just so physically gifted. He could do things with the basketball that I really never seen any other player do. You know, uh, 
So, and you know, another thing that I've noticed too is I'm sorry if I'm rambling a little bit, rambling a little bit in this video. Um, kind of making this video off the fly, but it's just you know something that I've read and uh, been kind of ticked off about uh, by certain new age fans who want to sort of revise uh, the history of the NBA and downplay all of the players who have been revered for so long and now they just want to market and overreach some of these new guys and I don't and I don't hate the NBA now I don't dislike the players there's a lot of talented players in the NBA but don't shit on these guys all right you know so I just think that um, Julius Irving uh, doesn't get his just due sometimes uh, oh the point I was going to make too is there's a lot made of the fact that he wasn't the greatest uh, outside shooter that he wasn't uh, a great three-point shooter and that doesn't make much sense because okay Julius Irvin was a guy born in 1950 uh, played basketball as a child I'm assuming from the very late 1950s into the 60s no three-point line uh, when he went to college uh, the late 60s into the early very early 70s no three-point line uh, when he went to the ABA, okay, all of a sudden there's a three-point line. So why do you just expect someone who's never had to shoot from that distance on a consistent basis to just be become a 40% marksman? Uh, doesn't work like that. No one just starts out a great three-point shooter. Uh, there's going to be people who naturally are going to shoot better uh, from outside, whether it's from the size of their hands or just uh, the touch they have, uh, like a Larry Bird or Ray Allen or Glenn Rice or whomever, but they still became great shooters from practice and repetition. Uh, Julius Irvin came from an era where where uh, it was more uh, predicated to being efficient. Uh, and, and taking smart uh, shots, um, he had a, a tr he had a very good jump shot. Uh, he wasn't perhaps the greatest jump shooter of all time. He didn't have a a, a mid range shot like a Bob McAdoo or a Calvin Murphy or a Rick Barry, but he had a very decent jump shot. And sometimes I think it's overblown about. Uh, his outside shooting he became he took the shot when it mattered and I'm pretty sure that he hit his fair share of outside shots uh, he was known for his throughout his career as a clutch player uh, there's footage of him hitting a shot I think from uh, beyond half court uh, in a game against the Dallas Mavericks a game winner uh, and also he recognized himself that he wasn't the greatest outside shooter. And he, uh, you know, because he recognized that, he did not take that many three-point sh shots. Uh, but he was truly uh, the class of the NBA and the ABA. And I think that he helped save the NBA in the late 70s before Magic and Bird. Uh, he was the face of the ABA. He was the featured star attraction. And I think sometimes he just doesn't get his just due. So, respect the history of the NBA. Respect history, period. And Julius Serving, truly uh, one of the great ambassadors the game has ever known.